Today, I'm so happy to have with me Mary Beard and Vanessa Stovall to have a discussion about digital epistemologies, how we use Twitter in the field of classics, and how we can support and help the trans community as a field. Mary Beard is a professor of classics at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Newman College. She has written several books on ancient history and culture, is active in journalism, and has written and presented a number of television programs for the BBC documentaries on art and ancient history, and a long-running weekly series on contemporary culture. Vanessa Stovall is an independent artist and interdisciplinary scholar of classical studies. On the art side of things, she is a professional harpist and composes music, lyric, and drama for the stage. On the scholarly side, she studies ancient mythology with focuses in hair, music, and the aesthetics of reception. And she is also the editor of the alternate classics publication, Corona Borealis. She received her BA at the Evergreen State College and her MA at Columbia University studying Greek tragedy. And I'm so grateful that both of you could be here today and have this conversation with me. So thinking about what's happened and why we're having this conversation, it all started when a single account asked, has anyone noticed that, you know, Mary Beard follows a lot of, I'll use the word TERFs here, trans exclusionary radical feminists, or often now they identify themselves as, you know, gender critical feminists. And at this, Mary Beard just responded, well, yeah, quote tweeted, is there a problem here? And a giant Twitter store storm ensued. And after an exhausting week of lengthy blog posts, long Twitter threads, and a whole lot of abuse directed at the trans community, it's time to like come here and unpack some of what happened, why it happened, and how we can do better as a field and learn from experiences like this. So today, I really am so grateful when I saw that Vanessa had tweeted that she wanted to have a conversation with Mary about why these kinds of problems keep happening, why these Twitter storms ensue, and how we can better communicate both intergenerationally and between different minority communities on Twitter, and really talk about how that affects our field as classics. So Vanessa, I'm just gonna turn things over to you and let you get the conversation started. Thank you, Kai, and um, thank you for that introduction. And thank you also for stepping up and offering to host this discussion. Um, because otherwise this would just be two cis women talking about trans issues, which doesn't always feel like the greatest. Um, so yes, I was very uh, glad at the chance to have this discussion and especially to have it publicly because I feel like there's not a whole lot of public discourse in the field of classics that has a tendency to uh, go behind closed doors more. So I'm really glad that SCS also was uh, glad to host this as well. Um, and so I wanted uh, to have this talk. And so the way that we, I envisioned doing it was um, in the understanding by design model, uh, which proposes uh, essential questions to reach an enduring understanding. Um, and so the enduring understanding uh, we want to put forth for this talk um, is to walk away from this conversation with some concrete ideas about how to move forward around this conflict uh, that is everywhere, not just in this one instance. Um, and to define the conflict and to discuss the different ways that folks can be an ally or accomplice in that. Uh, and to understand what it means if we can't answer some of those questions between the two of us here today, particularly because we are two cis women discussing, uh, discussing trans issues. Um, and so we're gonna go through sort of uh, holistically the entire process uh, and points uh, in the more minor and the macro with this one instance, but then take things um, into the macro, into the larger. Um, and see how this affects all of us, and especially how we're dealing with this new age uh, in the digital era. And then we wanna come back to our understanding and see what we've learned. Um, but I also wanted to take a moment to sort of reflect uh, on the absurdity of what we're doing. Uh, we are humans having a conversation over this strange digital medium um, and sharing it in this uh, new sphere that people are still learning from to further our understanding of it. Um, and it's pretty absurd, but this is how we have to be humans in this space and time, especially during the pandemic and the constraints that that gives us. Um, but I think it's also nice to just think about, huh, 
it's amazing that this could happen in this way and in this space. So thank you both for being here with me. Um, so to start with the points in the micro, uh, Kai gave an overview of the incidents. Um, and what I sort of wanted to break down was the dynamics that seem to be at play um, because I realized very quickly uh, in thinking about the situation that there seemed to be a generational divide sort of in questioning even some of the basic foundations around what had happened. Um, and I realized that maybe this needed a closer look at sort of the formations um, in these digital platforms that we have. Um, and so one of the first questions that we wanted to talk through was how do trans folks operate in different circles in our field, digital and otherwise, and how might we improve them? And I want us to reflect on this because one of the reasons that this incident happened was that someone had gone through uh, your followers, Mary, uh, which is something that can feel very um, uh, raw and intense to a person of like, well, like, why would people do that? Um, and yet, that's something that I recognize um, as sort of digital behavior that happens for any manner of reasons. Um, I personally do it because that's how I like finding more followers. Um, but I also know being from a uh, marginalized community, that that's also what people do uh, when they want it to signal or understand who people are following or understand uh, if spaces are safe for them in different ways. Um, and so Kai, Mary, if you had more thoughts on how you both operate in these digital spheres for yourself, um, I want to open it up there. I mean, I, I mean, I think what you put your finger on, Vanessa, actually, is the way that you know, Twitter looks as if it's a single space being used by its participants in the same, in broadly the same way. And I, I mean, I, I think that's that's simply not, I, I, I have come to see, it's taken me some time, but I have come to see that that is not the case. And that some of the ways that people use the space, actually for large chunks of the time, they get, along fine, you know, that, that people are using it slightly differently, but they're not coming head to head in any kind of way. It's, you know, everybody's chugging along you know, in, in a degree of harmony. Then occasionally um, one of those, uh, one of the clashes turns out, and I, I think you can never quite know what makes any individual uh, problem really explosive. and. Some of it is, you know, good or bad luck, I guess. But it um, it truly ignites. And I think here what ignited was were two different views of Twitter, one of which you've uh, you've adumbrated really well, you know, the idea that um, that Twitter is a place where you you actually form a supportive community. One of the ways that you form a supportive community is by being careful about followers, about blocking, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you create a safe space um, within the means that Twitter offers you to do. Now that's not, that, that is a perfectly logical and reasonable and in all kinds of ways admirable way to use Twitter. Um, but there are also people um, like me who are taking a, a, and I think that there's, there's lots of me's out there, um, who take a very, very different view by and large, you know, who kind of wear it as a badge of pride that we, um, we want to see the tweets of people we disagree with, we want to, um, you, know, we, we, you know, we don't want people kind of policing um, our followers, we kind of, we say I don't, you know, like me, I, I don't block anybody, if, you know, if people are being uh, oh, horrible to me, I just, I, I don't block them, I don't necessarily respond. Now, I think that those are both absolutely legitimate ways of doing it. And I think, you know, the response that I make against myself here is, of course, that um, the the model of using Twitter that I'm outlining, which I think is a good one. I feel I mean, I feel proud to espouse it, but it is a, a, a model of Twitter used by people who don't feel threatened. You know, that um, you can say, I don't block, I don't do this. If you feel reasonably confident that you can manage your Twitter presence without doing that. Um, and so 
I, I mean, I see what the problem is and, and I see where the clash comes. And I think it was obvious having had a, you know, a tiny quick look back is that the, my reaction, which was a very visceral reaction to somebody saying, you know, I've, you know, I've gone through your, you know, I've gone through Mary Beard's, people Mary Beard follows. And it looked as if, you know, I, I, I read it and I, I still don't feel totally certain that I read it wrongly, that, that somehow this was trying to, to police me. And quite a lot of other people read it like that. Uh, I don't think we necessarily read it right. I'm not saying that that, that was the right interpretation at all, but that, that is a sort of, uh, that is the reaction that a, a lot of people had. And I think it's not really, and I'll shut up in half a tick, it's not really a reaction to the the actual moment, which were only basically, it was under 20 words, wasn't it? Um, but it, it's, uh, it, it is one of those clashes where, where Twitter conventions absolutely co collided. And uh, that was the, re I mean, that was, I think, the, the ultimate cause of that. And it's something which I think I mean, I certainly need to reflect on that. I think everybody needs to reflect on that, that there are there are people in the Twitter community who are perfectly good, upstanding, fellow traveling people who are using this medium in a different way. And what do we do about that? And I do think that's a really good point, because like from my perspective, as you know, a member of the trans community and being a part of trans Twitter spaces, like a lot of people who I follow purposely don't let their tweets get too big because they attract bad attention from gender critical people and they start getting people tweeting pretty terrible things at them. And it's pretty normal for, I feel like people in the trans community to be like, hey, is this person safe? Is this person someone I should be worried about? Because there are other scholars out there who definitely aren't necessarily safe or have views that feel risky to the trans community. And so from my perspective, yeah, it was just very much a, hey, is Mary Beard safe? Is this someone I can, I can follow asking not, it wasn't directed right at you, it just used your name. And so like, and once again, totally different ideas of how Twitter functions. And I yes. think it's really important to talk about those things. Yes. Back to you, Vanessa. Yeah, I think uh, you both raised also good points that I want to link together too. Um, of Mary, here you were saying you were, you know, feeling surveyed, uh, sort of like almost. And I think that's a big issue that sort of also needs to be addressed of how people operate online, especially like in groups that feel like they might uh, be attacked or things like that. Is that like there is also like you know the government, the political on top of everything else that weighs. Yeah on this, which with the trans community in America, especially is something that's very pressing right now is legislatures trying to get driven in. I know a lot of trans folks are worried about surveillance of them online, but also just how much social media does broadcast about our identities, but also like our locations and uh, things of that nature as well. So I think, um, yeah, that's a good sort of thinking about the space of uh, digital media is very critical for us here. Sorry, sorry, Vanessa, go on. I, I shouldn't interrupt. Oh, I was just going to uh, transition. Uh, we sort of uh, already started to talk about our next question, which was just how do classicists uh, engage sure. with digital platforms? Um, but also, I just want to broadly more touch on that uh, in during this time period, especially this past year, uh, digital platforms have been incredibly vital for classicists, especially in just keeping connected in getting to know each other uh, for the first time uh, as we can't. Um, just even for like, I've had so many of my colleagues who are teaching right now, like it's the way they've engaged with their students or trying to use digital mediums to get their students more engaged in the classics. Um, and, Mary Beard, you're someone who is very into the digital sphere uh, with your classicisms. Um. I am, and you know, I've, I've got to make it absolutely clear that you know I have had some some occasionally rough times on Twitter in the last week. I mean, I I got quite a lot of rough time, but I you know there is no way I, I it would be com completely blind of me to willful actually to say that I'm in a a systematically. Um, excluded group on Twitter. That would be, you know, so the rough kind of rough times I have are as nothing compared to what other people have. And I, I know that. I mean, I think the problem is, I mean, it, it is partly uh, 
in classics and elsewhere about uh, particularly marginalized or excluded groups. I think that's true. But I think um, you, we can't lose sight of the fact that there is a, a rhetoric on Twitter, which is, in some cases is not a collaborative one. In some, it is very often a declaratory one. It cannot be a nuanced one because you don't have enough characters for nuance. And that uh, you're absolutely right, Vanessa, to say that, look, uh, during lockdown, it's become hugely more important because that is how we've communicated. But I think as we come out of lockdown, I mean, and this is, you know, maybe this little discussion is, you know, is part of that that it seems to me Twitter is only really useful if it leads to discussions that aren't on Twitter, that aren't 280 characters, and where you can, you know, actually look at somebody else, uh, engage with them. And it, it's a question of how to provide the interface between, you know, the, the tweet and the, the declaratory tweet and the, the longer term conversation. And I, I, I do sometimes feel that Twitter creates its own universe so that, you know, uh, you know unlike Kai and you, you know, we're, we've happily got together. Usually if I see a, something going bad on Twitter, I will usually try to say, let's talk about this someplace else. And very, very rarely is that taken up. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I leapt at this opportunity because it's what it's what seems to be the right thing. You know, you, you, I mean, I, in part, I, I don't take full responsibility for this, and I'm not, and I'm not going to. But I can't take no responsibility for it. Um, but you can you can turn something like that to something productive if you um, if if you move from Twitter elsewhere and then back to Twitter. If you kind of it widen the debate, I think. Well, that actually leads uh, to the next question that I think that I saw sort of where a lot of the initial conflict was happening, which is why is there such a generational divide with making statements of solidarity towards marginalized groups online? Uh, and this was something that I realized as just sort of talking about this situation with uh, various people that, yeah, there seemed to be a sort of like literal, like sort of barrier point of like 40 and below, people were just like, oh, of course, why wouldn't you? Like, that's so clearly obvious. Uh, but then going above that and even like uh, talking to my parents and older relatives, they were a bit more confused. And I realized I had to sort of maybe explain some of my own experience and then talking to more colleagues, I realized we all kind of had the same experience. Um, and Kai, I would uh, love to hear some of your perspective on this as well. Um, which is just that I think for uh, 40 and below, which is sort of the older millennials and younger, uh, most of us grew up online and sort of like the early stages of being online. Um, and uh, I think time is something that we have to consider here because uh, Mary, you're absolutely right when you say that Twitter is not always the most conducive space. Um, to a debate. And uh, it's always kind of been one of the wilier social networking platforms. Um, but especially in the most recent years, when a lot of people have actually sort of flooded onto Twitter too, uh, from different sites as sort of different digital domains happen. Uh, the digital landscape is actually fascinating. But um, in growing up online, a lot of um, us, especially since we were younger, um, since we were minors for the most part being online, just had a tendency to develop our own culture just around uh, stating plainly um, what we sort of believed, um, what we felt, uh, just how we saw situations um, in order to just sort of further communication. That adds sort of the opening of a door to have further discussion. Um, and I realized it was because many of us in different ways and different scenarios had all ended up in situations where we had felt just very unsafe online in different ways for different reasons. Um, and just what online being online sort of gives and affords you, um, like uh, the chances to be anonymous, the chances to uh, just sort of lie about yourself, the chances to sort of like make anything up. Everyone sort of like realized, okay, well, like 
if everything can be fabricated, like, you know, what do we want to, how do we want to communicate with each other when we just want to get to like, at the truth, like we can at least at the very least communicate because, you know, the internet is strange and fabulous and allows us to do sort of whatever and have freedom, but you know, we can at least like communicate directly with each other. Um, and it is like a strange, like unspoken thing though. It's like, uh, it came from years and years of just like experience and just like practice and just sort of being around different types of communities online and growing through that. Um, and it's really interesting to sort of like see now on giant platforms like Twitter, when you get all of these sort of multi-generational interactions, all of this just sort of chaos happening at any given time, because it's just like, you can't control sort of like what any one reaction will be to anything that you say. Uh, and so it seems for a lot of us, the bottom line is just like, well, like if we can't control what anyone's gonna say to anything, we can at least be clear about who we are and what we believe so that we can go back to that in the past and be like, see, look, this is who I am and what I believe, repetition. Yeah. I mean, I think that there, I mean, yeah, there is a big point here. We, we, we have to hope that it's, that, that we can come together. Otherwise the old will forever be kind of parceled off to one bit of Twitter. Um, but I, I mean, I started uh, on Twitter uh, more than more than a decade ago, but very much in the way that it was a different medium then, and it uh, it, it kept my I was pretty much forced onto Twitter through doing journalism because what you were using Twitter for was an extension of journalism. Uh, it wasn't about sharing. It wasn't about providing you with a community. It was very much a, a, an outward facing uh, medium. And there are still bits of Twitter that are like that, but they, you know, as we've been saying, they they can clash with the bits that that aren't. And I, I suppose in in many ways, most of my current Twitter interactions are um, are very outward facing. I mean, the vast majority are nothing to do with with anything controversial. They do with people. Um, tweeting me and saying, what shall I visit? I'm in Pompeii now, where should I go, right? So they're, they're very much an extension of um, either outreach or journalism. And I think that, you know, I, I don't have a solution to this, except that if we kind of recognize the different ways that we use the platform and we give each other a bit of slack and, and you know, just take a, a, a moment to think, ah, oh, maybe she's using it, they're using it in a different way, if we just put that, you know, it that might might help. And I mean, the, the only rule that I've ever managed to kind of formulate for myself, which I hope will be part of that, though clearly it wasn't in this case, um, uh, and we all break it, um, is that I think that I now try never to say anything on Twitter that I would not say to anybody's face, even when I don't know who they are. Um, and, I, and I don't think that's a, a solution because people are, I mean, you know, we don't want a world in which nobody gets angry and no one's ever rude to anybody else ever. You know, that would be, um, but that's different from a, a world in which people are cruel to each other. <laughs> and so I think it's very, you know, generationally, I think, transatlantically, Twitter's a global movement and there is, you know, and the number of cultural um, differences that there are buried in here means I think there's never going to be a straightforward answer for getting it right, but we can just be a bit, the antennae can be out a bit more. Yeah, I really like some of those points just really quickly to jump in. I do think that for millennials and younger, like if I was going to choose a virtue for how we like communicate online, I would say earnestness in some ways, right? Like there's this like really clear desire to be like, no, no, here's exactly who I am. So you can read me because you can't read anything else when you're online, right? You have to define yourself in so few characters. And so I think that's a really big value of being able to say like, hey, this is who I am. This is who I support. And I think in this conversation, it's really important to remember that while you know we're espousing this like don't be cruel have good dialogue there are certainly people online who don't feel that way and i think that's one of the big things that happened in this discussion in this twitter storm is a 
you know, the tweets happened and it kind of opened a door and suddenly there was a lot of cruelty happening on Twitter. And it's really interesting to think, how do we push back against some of that cruelty? I, I, I totally agree. Um, and, uh, and in a sense, when you, when you talk about the virtue of earnestness, I see earnestness as a virtue, but it's, but it ain't me really, you know, uh, and I, I see, I see the virtue in Twitter as a virtue um, in dialogue and debate. And I see it not actually, and uh, you know, I, I, I understand the privilege with which I say this, right? But it's not actually about me because I don't fit into 280 characters. Um, and if we want to know about me, then we have a discussion like this. And so, so I, I'm, you know, I get hurt, you know, and there was, you know, I, as I say, I'm, I can be reasonably resilient um, and, and I'm not being systematically hurt. Um, but there were some pretty foul things that were, were said about me, which I wish hadn't been. But oh, I think we, yeah, we all have those moments, <laughs> right? Those but... moments, everybody has those and, and they do scar you a bit, um, but, but actually that's different from these different rubrics and rationales that we've got um, and the syst systematic, I mean, um, prejudice and syst systematic abuse that people have, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't call um, uh, tweets telling me to get a new set of teeth systematic abuse, you know, that's, that's just offensive blokishness. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's sort of a good segue to get broader into the macro, into the larger ways. Um, but to sort of also briefly touch on um, what I was saying sort of earlier also about repetition um, and coming back to things. That's actually one of my favorite ways um, of uh, just sort of replying to things, especially when there are so short and few characters, is that at the same time, social media is also an archive. It's an archive of all the things that we've said and done. And there's nothing I love more people being like, well, what is your stance on this? To be like, well, look, this is what I've done before in the past. Like, you know, you should watch and engage with it. And let's have a conversation, absolutely. And it's a good way to elevate other voices as well, um, which in this instance, um, I think would also be helpful, especially thinking around marginalized groups. Um, and so to sort of get into the macro and sort of like the larger um, and thinking about more of the broader structures of this and sort of what we can do going forward. Um, Mary, we had talked about how you um, had felt like, you know, like, oh, this idea that like, you know, I have to make a statement, you know, about what I believe. Um, I, I would actually, uh, disagree or not disagree in a sense. Um, I think, you know, statements are a way to signal to people, you know, what you believe in, you know, here it is definitively. Um, but I would also say like in this day and age, um, especially uh, as I know me myself am almost in my thirties, like I'm kind of cynical and tired of just sort of like the endless like statement culture we also seem to be in it's like any tragedy happens and someone's just like i must make a statement i'm like why <laughs> like i mean um, look at any politician's twitter feed if you exactly. want the banality of the statement you know i'm yeah. standing proud with the and then fill it in at random and so i want to uh, push us away from the statement rhetoric and actually just encourage us to get more creative and like this is sort of like a like you know not a playing part because I want us to almost just like brainstorm um, and think of there are other ways to communicate uh, just sort of information about yourself without feeling the need to make a statement which can feel just sort of uh, bone gnawing and taxing <laughs> and just sort of like especially like uh, Kai I hear you we millennials are quite earnest I won't lie I don't actually <laughs> like how earnest we are it kind of grates my teeth <laughs> sometimes I'm just like guys I, we can we stop um when you I, people get to be over 60 you become ironic cynical and um well a bit like me I think yeah, and I think there are ways to still stay ironic and cynical and still be like, well, you know, here is how I support, um, but, but still not making a statement. And one of those ways I was thinking of was like, 
repetition of married. Like you have like helped uh, trans folks elevate their voices with the BBC. You could, those, that could potentially be a, you know, just like, hey, here's someone to listen to. And then just, yeah. I think I've done that. I mean, and I, and I suppose this is, you know, going the other side from a statement. And, you know, there might be something about, you know, being a 60 something in this um, that I think uh, I, I want, I want to have a record that I can look, look people in the eye with. You know, I, I want to, uh, I, I don't want to, to kind of feel shifty. I, I want to, I want to think that I've lived up to the ideals, you know, and when you get to be 66, you think, I haven't got much more time, bloody hell, to do it. I, you know, I'd like to think that I've lived up to the ideals that I broadly, broadly support. And I, I feel so much more um, wedded to, as we've said already, to act, to, to discussion, to, to meeting, to thrashing things out, to finding new ways of, of, of uh, agreeing or disagreeing or constructive ones. I feel very committed to the idea of a, a rhetoric of persuasion of other people, not, not outrage at them. Sometimes they deserve outrage, but sometimes persuasion would be better. But in the end, I want to be able to, you know, kind of uh, my profit, I want my profit and loss account of what I've done to look okay, partly to the outside world, but ultimately to my conscience. And that's partly, I think, why statements don't, they, you know, I just think, well, anybody could say that. I want, you know, I want to, I want to act. I want to say, in, in relation, for example, to the trans community, um, I want to say, I will make sure that I find constructive places for that community and other marginalised communities to have a voice on mainstream British television. You know, what I can do is a minute, you know, it's a tiny, tiny amount compared with, you know, when you think about mainstream television, it's a drop in the ocean, but it's something that I think I can do. And, and in the end, I think, well, stuff Twitter then, that's, you know, that's what, you know, that's where I rest my case, and not on a Twitter statement. And, <laughs> and I, I guess know I would say- I was very old. Right. <laughs> Thinking about this, I, I would then say, look, you know, I look forward to future collaborations and providing you ideas of how you can maybe support the trans community, yeah. right? Like, I'm listening, yeah. you know, I think, and, yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the things, the, the advantages about having a discussion is the discussion is also listening to somebody else. Otherwise, you have a lousy discussion. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, I have found it very helpful listening to you. I hope that you found it helpful listening to me. We probably still don't agree on a whole load of stuff, but I, but I, I feel, you know, I feel that our different points of view have been reflected upon, and that, and that's the, the bottom line. And to some extent, we've kind of not changed our minds but you can't just see where the other people are coming from different places and you know you can be you know I'll be more you know I think maybe I'll be more generous in future I hope so <laughs> I think it's also key that it's happening for the public though too which is why I didn't want to just have a private zoom discussion because I think it's also critical that this discourse happens in the public sphere as well so that people can understand, reply to it, engage in those conversations. I feel like, especially with marginalized groups, usually what they ask for for folks who, you know, are like, you know, like I was trying to be an ally. Like, did I like make a mistake? Like most of the time, all marginalized groups want are for folks to just process, go through the process of thinking through these things, which is exactly what you're doing right now. <laughs> and so like, you know, this is exactly what we asked for. And being able to do that publicly, I think, also makes uh, especially younger folks online feel better. Um, because I know, like, for myself, like, being able to, you know, go aside and have those conversations is uh, important and being able to have them privately. But at the same time, I also know that, you know, if I'm asking someone of like, oh, like, what do you feel about like, you know, this subject? And they're like, well, let's talk in private. Sometimes I'm like, wait, why, why can't you just tell me what you feel about this? What's so terrible that I need to talk to you in private? Like, but I know I'm also cynical and can sometimes just be distrusting of folks as well. And so 
you agreeing to have this publicly meant a lot to me because I was like, oh, well, absolutely. Then more people can have this conversation. And even the next time this happens, you can be like, hey, there's a conversation I had. Like, if you want to talk about any of my opinions that I had there, anything I put forth, like, let's discuss further. Like, I've already been having this conversation. And I think it does two things. I mean, one is that it enables you to, um, you know, these are complicated issues. At, at, at one level, they are very simple, but every simple issue has got a complicated inside and people are bringing different things to it. And um, sometimes actually having 45 minutes of conversation just is, is just a more accurate reflection. It is a really more accurate reflection. But the other thing it does, I think, is that it's the, the, the fact that we are having you know, a discussion, which I hope you're finding as useful and as pleasant and as friendly and collaborative uh, as I am, uh, we're having that online and publicly. You know, if that could, could encourage, when, well, when people are gonna to wanna to comment about this, I'm, you know, I really hope that the kind of spirit in which that we're having this discussion uh, will, will continue beyond it. And, you know, so, you know, if people were to uh, comment very acerbically to our discussion, I think they would have got the spirit and the tone of it wrong, you know? And I, I hope, you know, I, I, I would never want to say that there isn't a, you know, there isn't a place for acerbity and anger and rudeness, etc. I think there is. Um, but actually, this current juncture, I don't think, what we're talking about now is really, I think we get a bit further if we go on like this. Well, I think Vanessa, you made a comment in a prior conversation about the place of anger, particularly in marginalized communities. And I think if we could come back to that for a second, that would be like a really good place to like start sitting on some of those things. Yeah, I think um, anger is something to always uh, mediate on, especially um, at, uh, if we want to take a larger look, especially for like what's at stake for marginalized communities, um, right now in the year 2021, uh, even like, especially for the trans communities in the U S and UK, like there is a lot of anger that comes out of the communities and directed at the communities too, um, from different sources. You know, one is like dangerous because it is literally, you know, usually leads to things like legislation that can endanger trans folks' lives. But the anger felt by the trans community in and of itself is also something that like is important and to note because it is something that, especially on online platforms, uh, can come out in different ways um, and to understand where that anger comes from. Um, Kai, did you have a more specific uh, sort of Place you want to. No, I, th I think thinking about where the anger comes from and thinking about how sometimes anger is the only way to get people to listen, right? To be like, no, 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 I, I'm upset because you aren't listening. You aren't giving me a place. I don't have a seat at the table. Anger is a powerful emotion, right? Like, and figuring out who can express anger and why. That's a really interesting conversation. I, I think it is. And I think that the, the, the people like me who you know, have uh, who have a reasonably um, confident platform from which to speak, we tend to say and to feel, and I, I know exactly why, that somehow the the argument should be conducted in a spirit of courtesy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, you know, you know, that is. Uh, uh, what I, ins you know, that's my instinct. I also, um, you know, I'm sensible enough to know that um, courtesy and politeness is a privilege that the privileged have. You know, that it is, that, uh, that it's, that it is, it, only the privileged find it easy to get up and say, please be polite. You know, we can have, and now, uh, so, I, so I think, I know exactly what you mean, that there is a, a way in which, um, if you feel excluded from, let's say, one particular discussion or one particular set of social hierarchies or whatever, or culture or whatever, that uh, in a sense, um, what else should you feel but anger? 
and that's you know, you know and I'm absolutely with that. I think that anger is 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 better when it can sometimes at least be channeled into the brilliant persuasive rhetoric that we classicists are very good at. You know that you you know actually if we want social change we need both. We need everything. We need people to be angry. We need people like me to say it's more complicated than that. We need people to persuade. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, you know, happily, it's a communal, you know, most social change is a, is a, is a communal act. Well, I think one of the things that's really important to remember in this, too, is if we want this, you know, anger channeled into persuasive rhetoric, trans folks need to have a platform for that, right? Because, like, if there's not a platform, how do you present this persuasive, beautiful rhetoric without a platform to have that discussion? Well, that's why I, I mean, you know, when I say, and that's when I talk about my drop in the ocean, when I talk about, you know, making television programs and saying, right, let's, you know, let's include a trans voice here. You know, I'm not, you know, that's not the only um, marginalized or excluded voices we're dealing with. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in, in saying we want to have a discussion about this issue on television, we can't just have it by a load of posh white boys cis posh white boys right you know because that isn't any longer a discussion um but but i think it's you know it brings its own responsibility and you know as i'm sure you know you know this much better than me that um you know providing people offering people a platform can also offer them a good chance to get abused and you know there's you know there there is a, an awkward responsibility in all this, you know, but I, I hope that in the medium term, that will be it's absolutely normal, you know, absolutely normal. I think in, yeah, especially wanting to give people a platform and work, but also being worried about, you know, the abuse they can uh, seek. I think that's something important for us to think about, especially when just considering Twitter which in and of itself seems to be its own strange marketplace where people are always doing things uh, in different ways. Uh, but also it's, it, people have very different entourages with, that they bring with them to the marketplace. Um, and so I think that's an interesting metaphor uh, to realize that even when you like sometimes uh, are just like addressing one thing or asking about it, like uh, Mary Beard, you have 300,000 followers that uh, could all see it. Anything at any given point, not just this issue in and of itself, but even, you know, you commenting on the brand of jam you might buy at the store, uh, it exposes everything um, to that many amount of people. And when thinking about the interesting magnifying glass that social media can be. Um, that is something in and of itself that trans folks in the digital sphere have to be really cautious around. Um, and so that's where things like, especially when it comes to more private accounts, people not wanting to be public, people blocking for different reasons um, as well. Um, but also why I know a lot of younger folks had immediate opinions um, about this entire situation when it went down, because even without even sort of like thinking through who the folks were, they were just like, wait, but like this is one uh, Twitter account with 200 followers that made this one uh, tweet and then someone with 300,000 followers retweeted it and then asked a question about it so like of course why wouldn't like all of this discourse happen like because it was brought to this much larger pool. No, I, 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 I think that at one level it is perfectly legitimate to say to me um, you ought to be you've got so many followers you ought to be more responsible. You ought to think responsibly. You have power in those number of followers. What are you going to do with it? And I, I, I see the force of that. Um, but for whatever reason, and you know, it's a fault. But I think it's a fault I'm not too worried about. Um, I, when I go onto Twitter, I think of myself as having 300 followers. I don't. I mean, and and actually, I'm quite pleased that I don't think every time I go onto Twitter, right, I must remember uh, I've got 300,000 followers here. Now, maybe sometimes I bloody well should, um, but the fact is I don't. I, I suspect it's gendered, 
you know, in, at some level, I think the idea of saying I am a powerful person in the, you know, in the world of Twitter. You know, why do I reject a blue tick? Because I think, oh my God, that just draws attention um, to this. Um, and so I am still in my head, um, just uh, somebody with a small, you know, a small group of followers tweeting what she thinks. Um, and, you know, I take the, I mean, I, how, you know, I'd have to be dumb not to take the point, but all I, and all I can say in, in response is that I'm not wholly sad that my self image on Twitter is one of still being, you know, a little person in with the crowd and not someone who thinks I must use my 300,000 followers with great care. Um, you know, I'm, it's shrugging my shoulders. It's it's I know it's I know it's willfully irresponsible at some level, but it's also refusing to kind of say that that I'm going to manipulate that power or want to. You know, that's a it's that's a hopeless answer, but it's a true one. I just think there's a gray area always between the two, but I also know that we are closely running out of time. So I do want to wrap things back and tie them together um, to just think more broadly about um, not only the role of senior faculty um, and just uh, those who are just in higher places of education um, can be how they can understand um, trans issues, their students and colleagues, um, and create sport environments, but also uh, where do we get our information from our communities? Uh, who are we listening to? Um, I know that like five years ago, I would say like, oh, millennial and like older Gen Z, like trans and non-binary folk, that's who I listen to when it comes to like listening about non-cisgender issues. Um, but now I've had to sort of expand that and like think more broadly um, about different demographics as well uh, that I might want to be including. So I wanted to just open up this sort of end point um, to just sort of reflect on ways in which um, we can be supportive going forward, but also how we are gathering our own information um, and ways we might even improve on that. I think that changes very much as you go through your career, you know, and I've got only one more year left teaching. I have a, a, a totally fundamental and unbreakable principle that um, in the teaching that I do, um, I, it, it, it is absolutely incumbent upon me to make sure that everybody is starting off from a level playing field of being part of the intellectual community of which I'm a senior member. Um, I think that, uh, I think in all kinds of ways, my job is to make people feel intellectually challenged, maybe sometimes intellectually uncomfortable, intellectually uncertain, you know, possibly to think that their head hurts, but it is no good doing that if some members of the group are, are not standing on the same terrain as other members of the group. And that, and that in certainly in, over the last 45 years really of my teaching experience have been very, there are many different marginalized groups for whom that's, for whom one has had to be watchful. And, you know, I'm sure there've been times when I haven't, you know, because, you know, people are frail, but uh, I would think that that was, an absolute bottom line for what it is to engage in pedagogy. I think it's harder. Your question about where you get your information from is harder. Um, partly beca because within a university setting or a college setting, um, you know, I'm for better or worse, I'm much more remote from the students and what the students are talking about than I was 30 years ago. And in, in, in preparing this, I, I thought, oh, I'm at a women's college so, oh, in Cambridge. It's a women's college, which is cis women and trans women. We're all the fellows are women and all the students are women. Basta. My, my feeling about it when I thought that's actually quite a workable community. You know, that's, I, 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 don't, I don't spot a, 
real tensions in in that um, in that women's community. And then I thought uh, that maybe it's because they're not coming to me. You know, maybe it's because I'm not seeing them. And all I could do was ring ring up one of my friends who's about my age and a, a trans, who's a fellow of the college, teaches a very different subject, and said, you know, to say, Rachel, am I missing something? You know, can, you know, have you not been telling me something? And she was basically supportive of, you know, uh, of my sense that I, I was living and working within a community that were. I'm very privileged, I'm very lucky to do that. Um, but I mean, I think you're right. Where do, if, if I wanted to say what else do I need to find out and where would I do it? Um, well, I've got to listen, but who do I listen to? You know. So, I mean, I think that's, that's where we get our information from, I think is really important. And I, I, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Twitter, I say. I shall come to Kai in future. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy, you know, to be a source of a <laughs> reference, but I also like would love to point a whole lot of other people towards you who are absolutely fantastic and can represent other points of view because, okay, right, I'm a singular. Okay. It's you, I'm afraid I, I'm going to make a free line for you. You've, you walked into this. Sorry. <laughs> I'll have to start asking other people for help, I think. <laughs> But I think uh, if we're gonna talk really quickly about like who do we sit down with, that's why this kind of dialogue is so important. I mean, when else would I've had an opportunity to sit down with, you know, Mary Beard, Vanessa, I love your work. I love, you know, your Twitter presence, the activism you do, like, this is amazing. I love the opportunity to, you know, have this conversation and it happened because of Twitter. And it's sad that, you know, it happened in many ways because of a lot of really sad reasons and hard reasons. But the only way to move forward is to keep having dialogue and keep saying, okay, we, we're never done working on this. We're always going to have to have that repetition. We're always gonna to have to keep sitting down and talking and finding the new voices that don't feel like they have a seat at the table. And I do think that classics as a field, I can't really speak for the UK as much as the US, hasn't done a great job of providing trans voices a place in the field and the discourse about how we talk about gender and sexuality. And so I think it's important to start bringing that up and trying to find ways that we can be more inclusive. Yeah. And also to, I think, and I hope this is along the same lines, I think that we can um, be kind of be sort of understanding where other people are coming from and not always think that kind of that people of my age who do things a bit differently um, are necessarily because of that difference are necessarily malevolent. You know? um, I mean, we might be. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that could be the case, but no, no. not You know, people do things in different ways. You know, yeah. we contribute in different ways to the debate. We use different words, different rhetoric. Um, we feel comfortable and uncomfortable about saying different things. But you know, actually, we're we're probably a fairly we have a potential for being an inclusive community. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring up the generational issue initially in the first place to be like, oh, well, I don't think a lot of older folks are aware of these internet cultures that have been forming. And so like, I also appreciate this platform to just be able to talk about it and just share that these exist and these are the reasons why folks do them. And so it's like, it's not the youth, you know, all coming together, you know, trying to imaginary threaten you to make a statement. It's actually just a part of the cultural landscape that we need to understand is also there as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, actually Twitter is uh, like, as much as it is like, I, I, I can't leave this conversation without affirming that Twitter is a trash fire. <laughs> like it is one of the most like heinous uh, social media platforms I have ever been on. And I've been on quite a few, um, but I, I like it and will probably not delete mine for a very long time because uh, there is this potential to meet so many fascinating people. And uh, I've met so many trans scholars like in the past year alone because of the pandemic, uh, because of it. And so I, 
I do actually think Twitter is a good place uh, to hear more of these voices and discussions. And that takes time, that takes, you know, learning some of the weird algorithm landscapes that Twitter will put you through, uh, dodging a lot of ads. Um, but I do think that is a good place to go forward for the future. And you're absolutely right, Kai, like classicists do need to include trans folks into the gender discussions more. Oh, especially like I do theater. <laughs> like that's like the number one place. I'm just like, yes, come on. Like gender as costume, let's discuss, but also like differences in identity and differences in being different characters. Let's understand. Um, so I am very glad that we were able uh, to come together to discuss this and to start this conversation. Um, you know, I think, I don't think that we've, we've brainstormed, uh, we've shared perspectives. Um, you know, I don't think we've come away with like a Magna Carta-esque treaty of just like, this is exactly how we must go going forward. But no, this is our beginning. This is our start. And so I am very looking forward to how folks after they watch this, you know, want to continue this conversation and want to go on having it and discussing these issues um, because they are very important and very critical um, going forward in the field. And especially not just in the digital era, but like as we're becoming more in person with each other, like what types of care are we taking towards each other and ourselves? Like, what are we encouraging? What cultures do we want to build? What values are we grounding ourselves in? Um, these are all important things to reflect upon as we're now going to finally be seeing everybody in person for the first time after over a year. Um, and so thank you both for coming to the digital table. Thank you. Thank you both. And I really think that that point is such a beautiful point to end on. And I saw that idea that this is the beginning. Like this isn't an end. This is a way to get hopefully get more people to the table and start discussing the different ways we can move forward, the different ways we can be more inclusive, we can be more understanding, we can have better dialogue. And it just requires a little bit of time from all of us and a continued effort to keep moving forward and keeping better. So thank you both for being here today. Thank you. And I think we could I make would... a better place.